everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. For those of you I've not had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Susan Dusick, President and CEO of the St. Mary's Hospital Foundation. I'd like to start this evening by offering our thanks. Thanks for all of your support over this past year, your financial contributions, the notes of encouragement to our frontline team, your patience as we've all worked our way through this, this year together. And also um, thanks to the staff that have been here for our patients and our families. And most importantly, thanks for following the public health guidelines. We know the difference that this has made and we have truly been in this together. Providing exceptional health care is a partnership. You, our guests this evening, are both the backbone and the inspiration for St. Mary's continued commitment to providing the very best in quality patient-centered health care. In 2001, St. Mary's became home to the Regional Cardiac Care Center. And at that time, we made a promise, promised to build a regional cardiac program that could treat all issues related to the heart. And tonight, we get to make good on that promise and show you the final piece of the cardiac puzzle. Before we get started, I've been asked to remind everyone to feel free to ask questions at any time during the presentation by using the chat box located on the right side of your screen. And if you see your question pop up, you can like the question and it will move forward in the order for the Q&A that will follow Dr. Jolly's presentation. And also as a reminder, unlike Zoom, we can't see you. So sit back and relax. I now have the pleasure of turning things over to Amy O'Reilly. Amy is with Chartwell Retirement Residences, our House Call Series sponsor. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Susan. Hello, everyone. Thank you for participating this evening. As Susan mentioned, my name is Amy O'Reilly. I am the Business Development Manager for Chartwell Retirement Residences. We are so proud to be a sponsor this evening with St. Mary's Quest of bringing you important health information. For those of you who haven't heard of Chartwell Retirement Residences before, we are a Canadian owned and operated company providing a choice of over 180 senior living residences across the country. In Kitchener-Waterloo alone, we have four retirement communities to choose from, all offering a variety of care and accommodation options. Through this valued partnership with St. Mary's Hospital, we can provide both respite and permanent living safe solutions, solutions for our older adults in the community, especially those in need of transition out of hospital. It is with great pleasure that I now introduce Dr. Amjeet Jolly. Dr. Jolly is a cardiologist that has completed additional training specializing in abnormal heart rhythm. Dr. Jolly's work in electrophysiology is focused on managing and treating abnormal heart rhythms. With a father and brother who are both cardiologists, Dr. Jolly has continued the family passion of caring for others' hearts. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Amy, and thank you for everyone joining us on the call tonight. It is my pleasure to be able to take each and every one of you through some very exciting developments within the Heart Rhythm Program over the next 20 to 25 minutes. I look forward to hearing your questions, your comments, and for meeting several of you in person as we move forward in this journey together. We will start off with a video that begins with the development of the Heart Rhythm Program. And I will ask us to go to the next slide and take, take a moment just to pause while the video plays. So my name is MG Jolly. I'm one of the two cardiac electrophysiologists here at St. Mary's General Hospital. And we are in a mock-up of the future heart rhythm ablation suite uh, here within the sterile OR core uh, on the second floor of the hospital. So the purpose of mocking up a room such as this is for us to know exactly where every single piece of equipment fits, how it interacts with other pieces of equipment, and uh, where to put it in the room. Every piece is integral to performing the procedure and the patient flow through. 
And so we need to know that every piece fits, is mandatory, and flows as the patient comes through before actually purchasing the equipment and having it built and shipped to Kitchener for this procedure, which is why, as you see around us, we've completed a full mock-up of the procedure. The EP program at St. Mary's General Hospital right now performs a wide range of simple and complex pacemakers and other types of implantable cardiac devices. With the announcement of the minister recently, we can now move forward and complete our ablation program. What that means for patients is that they will no longer have to travel outside to London, Hamilton, or Toronto for us to do procedures to get rid of their abnormal heart rhythms. Whether through burning energy or freezing energy, we'll be able to treat our patients locally here um, in a shorter time frame uh, with the newest technology and hopefully the best success. You know, with thanks to the great generosity of our donors, we can not only mock up, but work towards the best equipment for our patients. Things that you can see in the mock-up here room, like the surgical lights, like the large 50-inch display, um, and including other things that you may not physically see in the room, but like a, a mapping system computer, or things that help us perform the procedure without using large x-ray camera throughout the entire case. Things that may, wouldn't have been possible without the generosity of our donors. Great, thank you very much. So that hopefully provides some perspective as we go through. And at the end of December and into early January, we were able to open the Heart Rhythm Program in terms of the EP Lab. What that means for staff is finally the ability to work in a novel and new and exciting environment where we get to practice all of these items that we were working towards, uh, offer them to our patients, and really take the next step in terms of taking it to our patients. With that in mind, what we have up on the screen before you are three separate letters from one of the early patients who had a heart rhythm ablation procedure performed. And you can see from the middle one on January 5th, as well as the updates on January 16th on the left and right side, that it was nearly immediate that this individual had a large symptomatic improvement. When you imagine patients who don't have access to care, they start to live with their symptoms and normalize their symptoms. And they really start to forget what it feels like to live again, what it feels like to be able to exercise again. And on the far right hand side of the screen, you can see here where the patient talks about being excited and energetic about reaching an 8,700 mile step, sorry, step milestone, which he had not done for several years before because of continuous heart rhythm and heart racing issues. I'll ask us to go to the next slide from here. This program, was a large operation funded by the community. You can see there, it required several million dollars of community funding over several years. And now that we have completed that part, we have the ability to offer patients heart rhythm services in the community. What that means is difficult to explain without having seen a patient experience that. Prior to this, they had to be referred to an outside facility and then travel to that outside facility. Several of, the, of these procedures require pre-op visits. They require pre-op imaging and diagnostic scans that have to be performed at the facility doing the procedure. So in most of our patients' cases, that was traveling to London for a pre-op visit and traveling back and traveling to London again for a pre-op CT or anesthesia visit and traveling back and then traveling again for the day of the procedure where they're unable to drive themselves. They spend the night in the hospital and now need somebody else to go pick them up and travel back again. And that repeats itself for follow-ups or for second or redo procedures, which sometimes occur in our line of work over and over and over again. 
And you can see from that short description that there is a large, sometimes unpassable barrier to care in our region. If we take a step back and look at what the statistics tell us, they tell us that individuals within the Waterloo, Waterloo Wellington region and within the Tri-Cities have the lowest catheter ablation rates in the province. Now that's not because the patients are any healthier or any different than average Ontarians. It simply represents a lack of access to care prior to the opening of the EP lab. Now that we have it open and we're able to do that, we are able to fill that care gap to have patients not travel to other institutions and to decrease wait times by several months, if not longer for our patients, which of course provides equitable access to care, but it also provides good quality care to our patients. I'll ask us to move to the next slide as well. So I'll start by explaining a little bit about what we do inside the EP lab and take us through a day inside the EP lab. But first, I should explain what exactly EP stands for, which is electrophysiology, and really what it means. And what we do is we study the electrical circuitry inside the heart in order to try and find where the abnormal impulses are coming from or going to and how to get rid of them safely and effectively for our patients. This is somewhat like an electrician with a panel in a house with being unable to shut the circuitry off, which of course makes it a bit more challenging for us to do. We'll start with this picture here, which is of one of, one of our anesthesia assistants, Kelly, starting to prep the room. Now let's just go to, to go to the next slide again. And really staff come in around seven o'clock in the morning in order to prepare the room. You can see from this image, just the amount of equipment throughout the room that is all utilized to help us perform this procedure safely. Every morning, the room takes at least 45 to 60 minutes for us to prepare in order to be able to accept the patient into the room. It's prepared from the anesthesia assistant side and the anesthetist side in order to help us and the patient journey through a three, four, or even five hour procedure safely and comfortably. It's prepped from the nursing side where we monitor blood pressure, we monitor heart rate, we monitor urine output, we monitor fluid intake and output from the body, in addition to the electrical signals. And the number of items that are placed on the patient are all prepped prior to the patient coming in. And then we can go to the next slide, the next picture. So this shows part of the team with a patient already on the table. Here, the patient's been moved in. You can see the anesthesia team near the patient's head on the far side of the picture, getting ready to help anesthetize the patient for their lengthy procedure. And now you can see a number of staff members, technologists, nurses, industry, helping us get set up in order to, to perform the procedure. Set up from the different computer systems which we use, from the hemodynamic monitoring that we use to monitor the blood pressure and the vitals of the patient, um, as well as our different equipment and track the different equipment as we go through the case. And I, I hope to just show how many individuals we have in the room at this point in time that are not me. They are the nurses, the technologists, the anesthesia, the anesthesia assistant, that is just part of a multi-person team that is used to carry a procedure from start to finish uh, in order to maximize safety, efficacy, and patient comfort. We'll go to the next slide, which will show you the control room, which is really the brains of much of the computer equipment. Here, we've got four pictures of a number of different computers and skilled individuals operating those computers, which is just outside of the previous picture. On the top left, you can see individuals 
uh, using a mapping system, which allows us to create three dimensional renderings of patients' hearts, knowing that each patient is unique and therefore their map is unique. On the top right hand screen, we have started a, a, an ablation or a burning procedure. And there are red dots on that screen that tell us exactly where we've been. We have lines that tell us where we need to go. And there are a number of information parameters that tell us that we're doing this in a safe manner, uh, that we don't burn for too short or for too long at any one spot. On the bottom left hand of the screen, we have another technologist who helps us look at signals, interpret signals as they go through the heart, measure the timing of signals as we go through the heart. And that tells us how much of the job we have done, how much is left to go, and where we are in that process. Knowing that for much of the case, we're looking at electrical signals and interpreting them to give us pictures and images for the case. And on the bottom right hand screen, we now put those two together. And so in addition to the nurses and the people we saw in the last photo, we have more team members in the back, three to four additional members who help us run the procedure from start to finish. We'll go to the next slide. These are pictures of us performing a live procedure. We'll start here in the bottom right hand case where we enter the body through the veins, usually the veins in the groin areas on both the right and left sides. Sometimes we will use the veins below the clavicle as well. Those are our access points to the body where we're able to insert catheters, catheters that can see electrical sources, catheters that can provide ultrasound images from inside the body, catheters that can burn or that can freeze tiny three or two millimeter areas inside the body for us to perform precision ablations within the body. When we're doing the procedures, as we move up from the bottom right hand to the bottom left hand, we have our own sterile gear from sterile gloves to gown to mask. We have protection from radiation as you see a shield there. And for us to communicate with each team member clearly and effectively, we have headsets so that if one team member sees something that needs to communicate to the rest of us, there's no distraction or interruption done during that, during that time. And then on the top right hand view, you can see that as the operator, I'm able to see everyone's individual screens. On that big display in the picture, we have it partitioned. So we're able to see the electrical signals on one side, the three dimensional rendering map on one side, the x-ray pictures on one side, the ultrasound pictures on one side, and then things like blood pressures and patient vitals on one side as well. I'll ask you to go to the next slide. And here we have a video that will play, uh, hopefully, that shows us what these maps look like and uh, how we interpret them. The different colors mean different things from purple being healthy tissue, from red being unhealthy tissue, and the colors in between showing us in be, uh, uh, kind of I'll call it moderately healthy tissue. And on the right video, we're even able to see how electrical impulses go through the body. Um, and here, different colors mean that they occur at different times. The dots also mean different things in terms of uh, how long we've been burning, where we've been burning, and where the next spot to burn is. I'll take a moment while these videos are playing to tell you a little bit about our day. I mentioned we typically open up the room around seven o'clock with the goal of starting our first procedure around eight o'clock. We do anywhere from two to three patients in a 10 hour day, meaning that procedures can take from as short as approximately two to three hours to as long as six to seven hours as we try and go through this case. 
Some patients are completely anesthetized throughout the procedure, but several are what we call under conscious sedation, where they are somewhat awake throughout this time. And that, prevents, that presents a unique challenge for our staff. Oftentimes heart rhythm problems become less frequent when patients are put to sleep. And if we need to see them in the procedure room, we need patients to be more awake than perhaps they would like. And achieving that balance between comfort and arrhythmia induction can also be a challenge. Now, we have been performing procedures every day for nearly three months, and we'll continue to do that in the next fiscal year, hoping to achieve over 200 patient procedures in the next year as we grow, grow the program and go forward, knowing that even at over 200 procedures in a year, we still won't yet meet the demand required by not only our own region, but by the province as a whole. So that as each year comes and we grow the program, we continuously expand access to care, expand the number of procedures that we're able to offer to our patients and help not only patients within our own region, but help Ontarians as a whole. I'll ask you to go to the next slide. As we show more live videos and pictures of just the amount of information and data. You can see as the video is playing, we have a burning catheter moving throughout the heart. It moves from heartbeat as it goes beat to beat. It moves as patients breathe in and out throughout the procedure. And of course, if patients move or um, wiggle on the table, it will move there as well. And so there are a number of different factors that we need to compensate for. Respiration or breathing, patient movement, cardiac motion, in addition to the electrical signal interpretation and, and the rest of the, of the different items that we do. However, the most important thing at the end of the day is not necessarily what we do, but how our patients are doing after. Having done this now for three months, essentially five days a week, we see patients who have a whole new outlook on life and that they're now able to do things that they weren't able to do before. Walk places they couldn't do before, jog, exercise, lose weight. And that realization that they can now do things is really why we do what we do every day. Seeing patients back in clinic, like the letters that we showed you at the beginning, really helps reinforce that we're filling a care gap that our patients didn't have access to before. And our job today during the pandemic is even more important than it was before. As we try and expand this care, help our patients and allow them to feel better and live life again. Once again, I should mention as we go on to the next slide that while there will be a few minutes for questions, this was not possible without support from the community, not only in financial uh, with donations, but in helping us move this project forward and now being here to learn about the project, be excited about the project and be keen and interested as we go and open new doors perform new and novel procedures and use what we have now sourced to be what I think is one of the most up-to-date and best heart rhythm facilities in the country, take that to our patients. So they have not just access to care and not just good quality care, but really 21st century technology and 21st century care. I'll pause there as we move forward with uh, a number of questions and I've left a little bit of extra time to hopefully allow us to go through some questions in more detail. Okay. So I'll start with the top questions that I see there and perhaps I could start by uh, reading them out to everybody so that everyone has a chance to see them as we go. So from, I'll just move my thing so I can see the whole screen there. Okay. 
So the top one here is from anonymous, what type of anesthetic is used? And the second part of that question is, is the patient awake? Those are two very good questions. They are somewhat separate um, and they do relate to the specific type of heart rhythm condition that we are treating. But I'll walk you through two separate scenarios. The first one is when we treat a condition such as atrial fibrillation. In a condition like this, where we need the patient perfectly still for four to five hours, where sometimes we need even the patient to stop breathing for a few seconds or a few minutes throughout the procedure. In this type of case, we really require a general anesthesia. And that patient is completely asleep throughout the entire procedure. However, I can take you to another scenario in which patients have short-lived, very fast heart rhythm procedures called SVT. And in those, the only way for us to be able to see the short circuit is for the short circuit to race or the patient's heart to race on the table. And for that, we do need the patient awake. So in a case like that, what we'll ask the anesthetist to do is to have the patient deeply anesthetized at the beginning of the procedure. And then once the uncomfortable parts are done, then decrease the amount of anesthetic so that they are talking to us. They're still usually groggy and will still usually fall asleep, but they're awake if we need to ask them how they're feeling, whether they're having any pain or shortness of breath during our, our diagnosis time or our looking time. And then when it comes time to burn again, we can then increase their anesthetic so they essentially fall back asleep again. So that is our, our, our most popular question with the level lights. I'll go on to the second one here from Sue. It says, what specific arrhythmias do you treat? That's the first question. And could you please explain the difference between atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter? So again, two very good questions. The first one is what specific arrhythmias do you treat? And the answer in general is gonna be almost all symptomatic arrhythmias are things that we can offer a catheter ablation procedure for, whether they occur in the top chambers of the heart, like atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, or whether they occur in the bottom chambers of the heart, like uh, ventricular tachycardia or extra beats occurring from the bottom chambers of the, car, of, the, of the heart called PVCs. So really, if there is an ablation procedure available in, in Canada for a heart rhythm condition, our goal is to have that available uh, at St. Mary's as well. The second part of the question is, could you please explain the difference between atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter? And this is a very common question that we see throughout our clinics as we perform procedures because they are different heart rhythm procedures and they occur in different parts of the heart. But to the patient, they often feel the same. Similar medications are used to treat them and they both can carry as risk of blood clots and therefore patients are often on blood thinners. The other thing I should mention is that 30% of patients who have atrial flutter will develop atrial fibrillation within five years after their diagnosis. And similarly, a high proportion of patients who have atrial fibrillation will also develop atrial flutter. And so they can both coexist in the same patient quite frequently, which can also add to some confusion. Okay, the next frequently asked questions is, what symptoms are necessary to require this intervention? And that is interesting because that varies from patients to patients. There are some patients who require, sorry, who had developed shortness of breath, tiredness, a difficulty in completing uh, tasks around the house, lightheadedness, or feel like they may pass out. And that will be enough for them to, to come to us in the clinic and say, my medications aren't working. I really need something done. Whereas conversely, there are other patients who may have less symptoms, but 
they also wish to have their symptoms eliminated or decreased. They may find that either they don't tolerate their medications, don't want to take medications for the long term, especially if it's going to be a several decade process. And of course, ask to, to go ahead with an ablation. That's in the context of our technology rapidly changing. Our success rates in ablation procedures go up as the technology changes. Our patient comfort improves and our long-term success rate also improves. So I say that in that patients who may elect to defer the procedure by one, two or three years may actually get access to different technology, newer technology, which may help us in the procedure as we go forward. I'll move on to the next question, which is what is your current wait time? And this is partly because we are a new program, it's partly because we have opened during the pandemic, um, and it's probably because of a lack of access to care. But our current um, advertised wait times for uh, ablation procedures will range anywhere from as short as about four to six weeks, depending on the type of procedures, to as long as about three to four months. Now, when we compare that to neighboring institutions, either London Health Sciences Center, Hamilton, or other neighboring institutions, because they have been doing procedures for a longer period of time, they've had the ability to grow a longer wait list. And so neighboring institutions will most likely have a significantly longer wait list at this point in time. As we move forward to 2022 or 2023, almost certainly there will be an equalization of wait lists across uh, Southwestern Ontario. But at the current time, we are short. Um, and that's partly because of opening during the pandemic, um, which will almost certainly change as we go forward. And the next question with eight likes is, how difficult is it to recruit skilled staff? And I think that's a good question. It, it is difficult in finding the right staff with the right skill set, especially during a pandemic um, in where individuals may not be able to travel between institutions due to COVID restrictions or COVID outbreaks. Our ability to identify uh, staff recruit them um, and, and train them is no doubt a large challenge within our, within our program. I think uh, our entire team has been quite dedicated, has been keen, has been learning both virtually and on the job even before the room opened. But it will be an ongoing issue for us to develop and grow the program because this is a very unique skill set. It is a niche area within cardiology, even as a specialty um, that requires an intense amount of training, dedication and skill. Okay, so the next question we have with eight likes is to discuss ablation versus pacemaker. And once again, this is a very common question that we get in the heart rhythm clinic. Really, they are two entirely different treatments, usually for very different problems. It'll be easiest to start with a pacemaker and to clear the air, a pacemaker in general terms will prevent the heart rate from going too slow. And that is it. It will not really do anything else. And so when patients come in and they tell us they have either an irregular heartbeat or a very fast heartbeat, this is typically not something a pacemaker is usually indicated for. It's when patients have a very slow heartbeat or their heart stops for long periods of time leading to them to faint or nearly faint. That is really the ideal patient for a pacemaker uh, in order to make them feel better and prevent problems down the road. The ablation on the other hand is designed to eliminate the heart rhythm issue in the first place when it's either going too fast or 
when it's very irregular, such as atrial fibrillation. There are patients who may require both, who may require a pacemaker in order to prevent fainting episodes, and then down the road have symptoms from their heart rhythm going too fast or not being able to be controlled with medications, and they can also undergo an ablation. The two procedures are not mutually exclusive. You can have one today and require the other one down the road and vice versa. You can have a pacemaker now and perhaps require an ablation down the road. Okay. The next question, what determines the choice of freezing or burning? And this is something that has also been published in the literature quite recently, uh, is a topic that we do discuss with our patients. But in general, burning and the technology used to cauterize or burn the heart is the standard of care throughout the region. It is our go-to. It has the most flexibility uh, when we need to go from different areas of, of the heart. Personally, I think that there are advantages to one technology over the other. And while in general, the vast majority of patients who undergo heart rhythm procedures in Canada receive a burning technology ablation, there are certain benefits to a freezing technology, specifically in terms of safety in reducing the complications, in reducing the severity of those complications, and of avoiding things like slow heart rates or pacemaker implants, which can be an unintended side effect of an ablation. I think really as the next 12 to 24 months progress, we will see more information about who is the best candidate for a freezing procedure and who is the best candidate for a burning procedure. And I'm sure that we will start to do more freezing procedures as time goes on here at the Heart Rhythm Program at St. Mary's General Hospital. The next question. Thank you for a fast, this part is fascinating and complex. I'll move the speaker window over a little bit. Is it true that all equipment, computers, tools, et cetera, needed for these procedures needs to be funded by a fundraiser? That's a good question. And while I may not know the full answer to the question, and when Susan comes on, this is something that perhaps she can attest to, a large part of the cost for this equipment, yes, is funded by a fundraising. That's partly because of the complexity required, it's partly because of the advances. When we start a project, knowing that it takes several years, the end result may have a different cost and may require different equipment than what was initially thought of in the, in the beginning. That's why it's so important for us to involve the community and why at the end of the day, while yes, I am one of the individuals who uses this facility every day, we were unable to launch this program and, and to continue this program without the support of the community and specifically without the support of our donors. So thank you. Go on to the next question with perhaps uh, just a few more questions left before uh, I pass it back. So what are the risk factors? And then the second part is, what is your success rate? So we'll start with the first part, which is risk factors. And I think it's important for patients to understand that while yes, we typically have risk factors that we can identify that increase an individual's risk of developing heart rhythm conditions, many of our patients don't actually have any of the risk factors. And just because a patient may have one or two or even three of the risk factors, it does not mean that they will develop the heart rhythm condition. Our own genetics do play a large decision-making part of who develops the heart rhythm condition and who does not. With that in mind though, there are specific risk factors that I think all of us on the top should know. And those are things like exercise or lack of physical activity, obesity, and really body mass index and an individual's weight does uh, directly correlate with their burden of heart rhythm conditions. Um, 
lifestyle, specifically in terms of alcohol use or alcohol abuse, knowing that a reduction in alcohol intake or even abstinence from alcohol uh, can improve patients' heart rhythm condition. And then patient comorbidities like obstructive sleep apnea, going for a sleep study, having a good fitting mask and using it, as well as having well-treated comorbidities, whether that be diabetes, high blood pressure, or heart artery disease. The second part of that question is, what is your success rate? And that will vary from procedure to procedure and patient to patient. Certain procedures will have success rates as high as 95 or 98%, like an atrial flutter ablation or an SVT ablation. Whereas others, although we may think we've gotten it the first time around, may require a second or rarely even a third procedure, such as an atrial fibrillation ablation. Those types of procedures may have lower long-term success rates, such as 75 or 80% after one procedure, with that number going up. Knowing that that is an area of a large amount of Canadian and international research, some of which were active participants in, trying to push that number up as high as possible. So that in an ideal world, a patient's first ablation, of course, is also their last ablation because it is the only ablation that they require. So I think we have time for one more question before I turn it over, which I see here, which is, what if you are unable to create the normal heartbeat during a procedure? And unfortunately, this does occur rarely, but it does occur. And when that happens, we as a team need to take a step back and try and ask ourselves, what is unique about this patient, about this individual, about this heart rhythm condition that prevented us from re restoring normal rhythm during the procedure? When that happens, typically we feel that perhaps the patient would benefit from the alternative type of technology. We know there are burning and freezing. And if we've used one and has been unsuccessful, that's where we will see the patient back in clinic and say, well, perhaps we should try the other technology. It is extremely uncommon for us at the end of the day, not be able to, I'll say, normalize the heartbeat at all at the end of the procedure. And so we typically have tools, tips, tricks that we have developed over the years in, co in, in coordination or cooperation with industry in order to try and maximize the success of the procedure, even if it still requires some medication after the procedure. So with that in mind, I would like to take one more chance to thank the viewers to thank uh, the foundation, as well as Amy O'Reilly from Chartwell, and to thank our community for supporting us, to thank our donors for helping us achieve an excellent heart rhythm program with the newest and, and most up-to-date technology. And as many of you come through the heart rhythm program, I look forward to the opportunity of seeing you, talking to you, uh, especially once this pandemic is over. I'll pass this back to Amy and thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Jolly. How can we possibly begin to um, thank you for all that, that you do? Um, I would also like to thank all of you for attending the first series of St. Mary's House Calls. If you have any additional questions, they can be emailed to communications at supportstmaries.ca which can also be found in the chat box. Information on retirement living, I encourage you to visit our website at chartwell.com. Thank you, enjoy the rest of your evening. Please stay safe and I'll pass it to Susan. Wonderful, thank you, Amy. And thank you also to our friends at Chartwell Retirement Residences for your sponsorship of our house call series. And again, thank you, Dr. Jolly, for the tour and the overview of the newest tool in our regional cardiac program. 
Um, I just want to take a second to add to Dr. Jolly's answer relative to is, uh, you know, is the community required to fund all of the equipment um, in a program like our uh, Heart Rhythm Suite? And the answer is yes. So the Ministry of Health has an expectation that communities will fund all new and replacement equipment um, within the hospitals um, across Ontario. Um, and this particular project was a $13 million project, um, which is the, covers the cost of construction as well as the cost of equipping the suite. And the community share in this particular program was $5.6 million. So they really stepped up and they really did bring this program to life because as Dr. Jolly mentioned, we would not have, it would not have been possible without the community support. Um, I think that certainly brings us to the end of uh, our, uh, our presentation for this evening. Um, I'd like to, again, thank you all for being here. And I'd also like to say that in the months to come, please watch uh, for some news and information on additional enhancements to not only the cardiac program, um, but to a number of programs across St. Mary's, all of which will require community partnership and investment. So I look forward to seeing you all. Um, and I, I guess I can actually say not really seeing you because you know we can't see you, <laughs> but you know what I mean by that. We'll see you all at our next house call session on June 24th. So again, thank you, good night and be well.